Funding for NJ Spotlight News provided by NJM Insurance Group, serving the insurance needs of residents and businesses for more than 100 years, and Horizon Blue Cross Blue Shield of New Jersey, an independent licensee of the Blue Cross and Blue Shield Association. This is NJ Spotlight News with Brianna Venosi. Good evening and thanks for joining us. I'm Brianna Venosi. Call it a sign of good faith. Today, Governor Murphy said the state could take more steps to open if hospitalizations continue dropping. Statewide, the number of COVID-19 patients is now down for the 14th straight day. But given the threat of new variants, Murphy isn't committing to hard dates or specific restrictions to be lifted. And don't get your hopes up. Murphy says the indoor mask mandate, that's here to stay for a long while. This as he extended the public health emergency for the 12th time since this pandemic began. Roughly 3,700 new positive cases today, another 92 lives lost. But the administration says the state's six vaccine megasites hit a new milestone, more than 13,000 doses given in a single day. Overall, nearly one and a half million shots have been put in arms. More than 412,000 residents are now fully vaccinated with their second shot. If you did manage to secure a coveted appointment for tomorrow, check to make sure the location will be open. Two mega sites in Burlington and Morris County will be closed thanks to another snowstorm on the way. Winter weather has delayed vaccine shipments across the country, just another hurdle in this massive rollout. Key parts of it hinging on New Jersey's own Johnson & Johnson vaccine coming online. Emergency use could be less than 10 days away, but new information shared this week by the federal government puts much lower expectations on the number of J&J doses we should expect at first, even as the Biden administration promises 600 million doses of all approved vaccines to be available by July. Senior correspondent Brenda Flanagan reports. High hopes for fast delivery of J&J's single-dose COVID vaccine got knocked down a couple notches today after Biden administration officials confirmed the company will initially produce just a few million doses right after federal emergency approval. That unexpected kink in J&J's pipeline could impact both national and New Jersey plans to step up widespread public vaccinations, and the state's now unsure of how many doses to expect. We haven't been counting our doses for, um, for, from the J&J &J vaccine because we really haven't known what's going to be available at the time that there's likely to be an emergency use authorization. Um, they're meeting next week around that time. J&J &J will actually come out and tell us uh, with the government of how, much, how many doses will actually be available and when because they haven't had said when they'll start to ship as well. We're working with the company to do everything we can, assuming they are approved by the FDA, to bring forward as much, many of those doses as possible into the earlier months. It looks like J&J &J has a hiccup on production. Dr. Martin Blazer says J&J &J packs enough industrial muscle to ultimately deliver the promised doses, 100 million by the end of June, but... They're planning to produce, it's just not quite at the scale that everyone was hoping for. And, you know, every hiccup uh, costs us and ultimately will cost lives. It certainly throws a wrench in public health timelines. Dr. Anthony Fauci had expected to open up vaccine eligibility to everybody who wanted a shot by the end of April. That was predicated on J&J, &J, the Johnson product, having a considerably more doses than now we know they're going to have. So that timeline will probably be prolonged maybe into mid to late May and early June. J&J &J applied for an emergency use authorization from the FDA for its COVID vaccine on February 4th, and today said in a statement, the company intends to distribute vaccine to the U.S. government immediately following the authorization and expects to supply 100 million doses to the U.S. in the first half of 2021. But J&J &J didn't offer any hard distribution dates. Delays could slow walk the Murphy administration's plan to use J&J's vaccine for inoculating hard-to-reach populations. Just last week, they announced great expectations based on J&J's initial estimate. Johnson & Johnson has set it hopes to provide the federal government with 100 million doses by April. 
The J&J vaccine is, the, is only one shot and doesn't require ultra-cold storage. The vaccine will travel better. And in fact, it will travel so well, it would be easier to deploy the vaccine closer to where individuals live. Dr. Fauci figures it could take till the end of summer or early fall to get everyone vaccinated. But to do that, Blazer says the U.S. will have to pick up the pace well beyond the current rate of between one and a half to 1.7 million shots a day. Well over a million people are getting vaccinated every day. So that's great. But on the other hand, we're a country of 330 million people. So that's a million a day, 330. That's that's uh, that's almost a year. It'd take about three million shots a day to hit the Biden administration's target, he says. And having to wait longer to deploy J&J's hundred million doses only makes that a tougher task. I'm Brenda Flanagan, NJ Spotlight News. Another tough task, passing a cleanup bill for recreational marijuana. Even once the details are hammered out, criminal justice advocates say there's still a number of laws on the books in need of reform. For starters, mandatory minimum sentencing. More than a year ago, a commission found requiring a person to serve a minimum amount of time before parole eligibility is responsible for massive racial disparities in our state prisons, where the incarceration rate for blacks is 12 times higher than for whites. But another last-minute add-on in a Senate committee has stalled the bill for months. Now lawmakers might be ready to break that impasse. Our senior writer, Colleen O'Day, is following the story. So, Colleen, you were listening in as lawmakers met this week. Where do we stand with this? So the Senate Judiciary Committee is the body that cleared the bill yesterday, 7 to 0. Um, that's the first step in the Senate for this piece of legislation. There was a prior bill that had made it through the assembly um, and then was amended in the Senate. Uh, and that one is at a standstill. So we're, we're kind of starting from scratch again. What's causing the holdup? Well, what happened is the Sentencing Commission in its report in November of 2019 had recommended um, the end of mandatory minimum sentences for drug crimes and uh, nonviolent crimes, uh, property crimes. Uh, what one senator added to that bill in amending it was um, making there be no mandatory minimums for official misconduct charges. And that really rubbed a lot of legislators the wrong way. And it's something that the governor has said he also does not support. Um, well, this now was, the bill this that was Senator was, Nick Sacco correct? Who, yes, who had a personal correct, interest right. in that? Uh, there certainly seems to be. His girlfriend's son is uh, facing some misconduct charges um, in North Bergen, which just happens to be where Sacco is the mayor. Um, so th that really held it up. But the bill that was passed yesterday actually now covers all nonviolent crimes, and it does include misconduct. So it's really kind of unclear where, you know, what the future of this is. What are social justice um, advocates saying about it, Colleen? Are they happy with where this bill is headed and what's in it right now? So they're really saying at this point, you know, if it's an imperfect bill, it's an imperfect bill. Um, let's deal with it. But we have to get this through because we have so much uh, racial disparity within the prison system. And there has been you know, just too many people who continue to be held in prison on, you know, some of them at least some fairly minor drug charges because perhaps they were caught within a, a thousand feet of a school. That was the drug free school zone law that we put in place back in the 1980s. And, you know, they have to serve a certain amount of time without parole under the mandatory minimum. So they say we really just have to get rid of these. All right. Colleen O'Day for us there. Thanks so much, Colleen. Thank you, Bray. Yeah, those official misconduct charges carry a five-year minimum sentence, but it could be a lot more for a handful of North Jersey politicians indicted this week by a state grand jury stemming from bribery charges in 2019 that read a lot like a scene from The Sopranos. Thousands of dollars of cash stuffed in paper bags, even a coffee cup. Bribes masked as campaign contributions for promises of no-bid contracts and other favors. The defendants include former Jersey City Board of Ed President Sudan Thomas, ex-Assemblyman Jason O'Donnell, former Morris
Morris County Commissioner John Cicero and ex-Mount Arlington Councilman John Windish. The grand jury indicted all four on second-degree bribery charges to face official misconduct and other charges. According to Attorney General Grabeer Graywall, it's old-school political corruption at its worst. There's another storyline that seems to be playing on repeat. That's more snow. Another winter storm is expected to hit the state Thursday into Friday afternoon. This is going to be the stuff that's tough to shovel. Wet, heavy snow, according to the National Weather Service. Forecasters predict anywhere from 4 to 9 inches. A messy mix is likely to fall at the shore and potential for dangerous ice in most counties. Some of it has already started thanks to the thaw-out much of the state experienced yesterday. When will it start? Rutgers meteorologist Steve Decker is here with the latest. Steve Decker, feel like we're seeing a lot of you this winter. If I live in North Jersey, am I going to see this snow when I wake up tomorrow morning? You will start to see the snowflakes flying right around sunrise and then picking up uh, within a few hours after sunrise for sure. What are your models showing you as far as where the storm is tracking and where we're going to see sort of the highest amounts? So the storm is tracking in just the right place to yet again put central and north parts of the state under the gun for the most snow. Uh, we're not certainly not looking like anything like that storm from a few weeks ago where some places had 30 inches or more. It's more of a sort of broad five to nine inches uh, across central and northern parts of the state. But even all the way down to Cape May, some uh, snow will be seen tomorrow. Are those totals pretty consistent, Steve, the, the, the four to nine inches um, with what you all were e expecting and anticipating for this? So certainly there have been some trends towards a little bit of a cooler system, so lower temperatures, meaning less chance of rain getting into a lot of the state until you, if you're waiting down in South Jersey, it probably should change terrain eventually. And that's one of the reasons why they'll be getting less snow down there. But uh, uh, areas in central and north Jersey, certainly there could be some sleet and mixed precipitation, but the chances of just plain old liquid rain, it looks like it's going to be too cold uh, for areas north of, say, you know, 195 to get uh, anything that's liquid like that. Let's talk about just ice and, and what this is going to mean for driving conditions. Um, if we need to be out on the road tomorrow for work, uh, what do you expect to see there? Right, so certainly any untreated surfaces will be pretty treacherous tomorrow. We have had a cool day today and it'll be cold tonight. So any, I think once it hits the ground, it's gonna stick immediately. Any if sleet and freezing rain is going to be sticking and accumulating ice. So uh, it really will depend on you know how you quickly folks can get to the main roads plowed and salted. Uh, once the daytime comes, because this will be a daytime event, even when it's cloudy, you know, some of that sunlight is getting through and that should keep the treated surfaces probably in decent shape, but that's the key. As long as they're treated well, they should be okay. Are we going to see, Steve, these thick sort of, you know, an inch or more an hour uh, precipitation like we did with the last big storm where you looked out your window and, and you couldn't even see across the street to your neighbor if you have them? Right. It certainly looks like there will be a few periods where it could, could be coming down that heavy an inch or more per hour, especially around the noontime hour. I'm almost nervous to ask, but is this the last of it? <laughs> uh, it doesn't look like we have any big storms in the offing, but uh, winter is not over, so I would not be surprised at all to see more snow uh, later on for sure. All right, Steve Decker, good to see you. Take care. Thank you. And meteorologists like Steve Decker say these storms are just chewing up our shorelines, swallowing dunes, leaving the destruction of coastal flooding in its path. That erosion means shore towns are at the mercy of every tide, scrambling to make repairs before summer. As Joanna Gagas reports, it's a problem that plagues us with few who agree on a long-term fix. A couple of weeks ago, we had a very slow-moving nor'easter that had high tides that lasted over several days. And those high tides, says Dave Rosenblatt, caused significant erosion of the beaches in coastal areas like Long Beach Island, Atlantic City, Bayhead, and North Wildwood. Many had scarped dunes. Scarping means cutting in at a basically a right angle to the beach or to the dune. So that's why in places like Bayhead, you'll see a drop off from the top of the dune down to the beach berm. Uh, there it's about 
10 to 15 feet. To restore the beaches, the Army Corps of Engineers dredges up sand from the ocean floor and pumps it back onto shore. Most beaches are designed to be on a three or four year cycle of replenishment, but... When we have storms like this, we will have to uh, come back a little bit more frequently when, than the cycle would demand. Is dredging a long-term solution because it is a cycle and as sea level rises, is that still the best way to protect the shore? Uh, it, we're protecting a very valuable industry, our tourism industry, uh, the shore real estate industry. People want to have beaches in New Jersey, but it will become more difficult as sea level rises and the coastal storms intensify. Uh, we'll have to put more sand on the beaches. We'll have to do it more frequently. We'll have to build the beaches out a little further. Uh, but we will be doing beach replenishment into the, into the foreseeable future. And that's a mistake, says environmentalist Jeff Tittle. We keep shoveling uh, sand against the tide. You know, when Hurricane Sandy hit, New Jersey lost more than $2 billion worth of sand that just got washed into the bays or out to sea. And we really need to come up with a better approach to uh, replenishing our be beaches. One that doesn't compromise ocean life, he says. We end up going out to areas that are called mounds where barrier islands used to be, and they're important for fisheries. Um, that's where fish breed, and there's a lot of uh, plant life and kelp and other things. And we end up scouring the bottom of the ocean there and pumping it on the beach, killing the, the, the fisheries and the fish along the way. And he says dredging changes the shape of the ocean floor. The angle of descent becomes steeper instead of like a four or five percent slope, it becomes like a eight or nine percent slope. And that does two things. It causes the beach to erode out faster and it causes riptides. Rosenblatt disagrees. When we do dredging offshore, the dredging occurs two, three miles out often. And uh, so what's happening out there is not related to what's happening on the beach itself. Is there anything new that's being tried that hasn't been tried before? The Army Corps of Engineers has been conducting uh, two studies trying to determine what else we can do to prevent the flooding that we see uh, during storms like this nor'easter and bigger storms uh, like Sandy. The studies examining areas like the harbor and tributaries between New Jersey and New York and the back bay, the water behind the barrier islands, considering solutions like large floodgates across inlets. These are major civil works projects. They're very expensive. And when I say very expensive, I mean in the billions and billions of dollars. His department's budget, $25 million. But both Rosenblatt and Tittle agree that strengthening dunes, using things like old Christmas trees, is a critical step to minimizing erosion. For NJ Spotlight News, I'm Joanna Gagas. President Biden appears to be picking up where his old boss left off, clearing the way for some long-stalled transportation plans. Rhonda Schaffler has the details in today's top business news. Rhonda. Brianna, from north to south Jersey, some key transit projects are moving forward. Let's start with the big one, and that's the Gateway Project. A roadblock holding up work has been lifted now that the Biden administration will allow state governments to use federal loans to pay their share of the $13 billion project. That reverses a policy that was set by the Trump administration. Governor Murphy says New Jersey can make up for lost time and get the program and the thousands of jobs it will produce back on track. Meantime, in South Jersey, the governor today announced a proposed $250 million revamp of the outdated Walter Rand Transportation Center. This transit center opened in May of 1989. Camden has changed a lot over the past 32 years, and much of it for the better. Let's give this city a transit center that mirrors its exciting future. The goal is to update and enlarge the center to better serve commuters. The Murphy administration plans to form what's being called the New Jersey Council on the Green Economy, which will make recommendations on sustainable economic development. Business leaders and environmentalists will have their say in the process. Anthony Russo of the Commerce and Industry Association of New Jersey is optimistic. I think as long as there's a deliberative process where everybody has a seat at the table, and there's science and there's fact uh, and leave the politics out of it, leave the perceptions out of it. I, I think you can strike that balance to protect the environment and also protect our economy. One of the council's big goals is to create some much needed new jobs. 
State tax collections got a boost from holiday shopping. The January revenue numbers released by the state show that sales tax collections rose 5% in December. Year-to-date sales tax revenue is running ahead of projections, but income and corporate business tax collections so far this fiscal year are below last year's numbers. Small businesses can once again get help paying for their PPE. Businesses with 100 or fewer employees are able to apply to the EDA's PPE program, which offers discounts of nearly 70%. Now here's a look at the Wall Street Trading Day. I'm Rhonda Schaffler, and those are your top business stories. In Atlantic City, the end of an era. 3,000 sticks of dynamite, 39 stories, more than 30 years of history. The Trump Plaza came crumbling down shortly after 9 a.m. this morning. Nothing but a billowing cloud of smoke and debris left in its place. The former hotel and casino has been vacant since it closed in 2014, one of four casinos that shuttered at the time, victims of an oversaturated market. Some reported bidding hundreds of dollars to get a front row seat to the action today. Others, they bundled up and watched from the beach, dozens of cars lined up in Bader Field. It all took just 20 seconds to bring down what was once the crown jewel of the former president's casino empire and comes less than a week since Trump was acquitted of inciting a deadly riot at the Capitol. Meantime, the fallout from the nation's first ever second impeachment trial of a president continues, with Democrats peddling the idea that the Republican Party is in chaos, fractured beyond repair. But many members of the GOP argue the situation is quite the opposite. Without a former reality star turned leader grabbing all the headlines, it might just clear the way for their agenda. Senior correspondent David Cruz reports. A more fitting symbol would be hard to find. Donald Trump's old AC casino, like his presidency, crumbling before an eager New Jersey audience. But does that mean that the former president, defeated at the polls and now twice impeached, will lose his grip on Republican politics? The answer to that depends on who you ask. I think once Trump goes away, they're going to start fighting each other, right? So I think the leadership uh, is recognizing that. And so as long as they can make Donald Trump the lightning rod, they can keep the party together to some extent. Mike Doherty has been a longtime Trump supporter, still extols his virtues as a commander in chief. But he says the former president never had as tight a grip on New Jersey Republicans as he's had with Republicans across the country. Here it's about school funding. It's about uh, Murphy's handling of the coronavirus. It's about property taxes. It's about uh, reopening small businesses. These are issues that uh, have nothing to do with what's going on at the national level to a large extent. Those are really state issues. And in an election year, did we mention that 2021 is a big election here in New Jersey? Voters will be less focused on Trump tweets and more focused on Phil Murphy mishaps. At least that's what presumptive Republican gubernatorial candidate Jack Chitterelli says slash hopes. Here's what I find. People are focusing on New Jersey. People want to know how Jack Chitterelli versus Phil Murphy is going to improve their quality of life, their lot in life, how we're going to fix the problems they're up against every single day. The relationship between Trump and Chitterelli has been, as they say, complicated. Chitterelli once called Trump a charlatan and bad for the party. He pivoted away from that position after Trump got elected president and will now have to walk that fine line between the more moderate Jersey-style republicanism and the more strident Trumpism. I know this. Phil Murphy wants this election to be all about Donald Trump. They keep referring to Jack Cittarelli as a Trump Christie Republican. I'm Jack Cittarelli. And by the time this 10 months is over, people will know that. And I'm confident in the outcome of this election. Pollster Patrick Murray says Trump's sway over the party, as evidenced by recent censures of GOP lawmakers who voted to impeach him, remains. If you didn't need any more evidence of the past five years, just the censures that are happening right now for, uh, you know, members of Congress uh, voting their conscience uh, is all the evidence I think that you should need at this point uh, to know that Trump has really taken over the Republican Party, and the, the hearts and minds of, of the National Republican Party. Still, Murray agrees that voters in New Jersey will be thinking of state issues first when going to the polls in November. The voters first look at the person who's in office and say, do they deserve another four years? 
If the answer to that is yes, it doesn't matter who the opponent is, whether they're aligned with Trump or not. And what you have to then, you know, hope for if you're Jack Chitterelli is that that kind of that that Trump uh, phenomenon, uh, <clears throat> the, the, the Trump image doesn't hang over top of them in a gubernatorial race. Trump's influence here would have been an interesting question to have debated during a Republican primary. But the Trumpiest of New Jersey's Republicans dropped out of the governor's race before it could be raised. I'm David Cruz, NJ Spotlight News. With more than 2 million unemployment claims filed since the start of this pandemic, there are plenty of problems and questions to be answered. Department of Labor Commissioner Rob Acero Angelo gets in the hot seat with senior correspondent David Cruz on Chatbox Thursday evening at 6.30 p.m. on the NJ Spotlight News YouTube channel. Get your questions in early. Email them to chatbox at njspotlightnews.org. Don't miss it. In the meantime, head over to our website, njspotlightnews.org, or any of our social channels to continue following our reporting. I'm Brianna Venozzi for the entire news team. Thanks for being with us. We'll see you tomorrow. The members of the New Jersey Education Association, making public schools great for every child. RWJ Barnabas Health, let's be healthy together. And Orsted, committed to the creation of a new long-term, sustainable, clean energy future for New Jersey. In uncertain times, you need someone who has your back. That's why at Horizon Blue Cross Blue Shield of New Jersey, we make sure our health plans have all the benefits you need. More ways to get care virtually. More support for your mental health too. More tools on your phone. All in a range of health plans so you and your family can find just what you need. And we can help because everyone should feel like someone has their back, not just in uncertain times, all the time.